Reshnik, I'm a third year resident at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Today I'll be presenting an interesting case of alopecia occurring in the setting of mastocytosis. Mast cells were first recognized in 1863 by Frederick von Reckinghausen as granulated cells in the connective tissue of tadpoles. They were named roughly 15 years later when Paul Ehrlich, assuming these granules were large amounts of ingested nutrients, gave them the name mastzellin, meaning well-fed cells. For 75 years, mast cells were described as the concern of histologists and pathologists alone, until 1938 when Nicholas Michaels published his thesis outlining over 25 hypothetical functions of the mast cell. None of these 25 theories were correct, but it did spark interest in the scientific community, and as we'll see, mast cells have become of multidisciplinary concern. I'll describe our case of a 30-year-old female who presented in August 2020 with a history of patchy hair loss. She described losing large chunks of hair, worsening over a period of several weeks to months before she sought care. She was initially believed to have alopecia areata and was treated with a clobetazole ointment as well as Kenalog injections. Though she did note some improvement in her condition, she began to develop large indentations in her scalp believed to be secondary to steroid treatment, so this was subsequently discontinued. Her symptoms continued to evolve, and she developed new erythematous patches and significant irritation of the scalp. This prompted her clinician to perform a punch biopsy of the left frontal scalp in December 2020. Features of non-scarring alopecia were identified, including those listed here. And as we'll discuss, the presence of inflammatory cells is not an uncommon feature of alopecia areata, which is classically described as having a swarm of these lymphoid infiltrate at the level of the hair bulb, which is referenced in the image on the right. But while mast cells are also seen in the scalp, both in cases of alopecia and control scalp biopsies, the numbers reported have been highly variable. In this case, however, such a fluorid mast cell infiltrate was identified, as we can see here, and here, that our pathologists had to consider the possibility of a partial sampling of a mastocytoma or even involvement of the skin by a systemic mastocytosis. So why do we care? Well, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about mastocytosis in general. Mastocytosis is a clonal neoplastic proliferation of mast cells that accumulates in one or more organ systems. The clinical manifestations are quite heterogeneous. They range from skin lesions to highly aggressive neoplasms associated with multi-organ failure and poor survival. The WHO has three overarching categories of mastocytosis. Cutaneous, in which mast cell infiltrate remains confined to the skin. Systemic, in which there is involvement of at least one extracutaneous organ, with or without evidence of skin lesions and mast cell sarcoma, which is an incredibly rare entity characterized by destru destructive growth of highly atypical mast cells. Uh, mastocytosis can occur at any age. However, cutaneous mastocytosis is far more common in children, and it can even be present at birth. There's also a slight male predominance in these variants. Systemic mastocytosis, on the other hand, is generally diagnosed after the second decade of life, with a relatively equal gender prevalence. This condition is usually sporadic and is associated with a somatic kit mutation, though rare familial variants with germline mutations have also been reported. Approximately 80% of patients with mastocytosis have evidence of skin involvement, but for those with systemic mastocytosis, the bone marrow is almost always involved. And for that reason, morphologic and molecular evaluation of the marrow is highly recommended in adults to either confirm or exclude the diagnosis. As we can see on the left, these lesions are usually fairly well circumscribed. Classically, they occur in the paratrabecular or perivascular areas, but can be randomly distributed in the intertrabecular regions as well. In the image on the right, we can see an aggregate of lymphocytes surrounded by polygonal mast cells with a pale granular cytoplasm. 
In rare instances, the peripheral blood can even show uh, leukemia due to a significant number of circulating mast cells, but other organs can also be involved. Uh, and this includes the liver, GI tract, mucosa, spleen, or basically any other tissue. As a general rule, skin lesions are more often observed in the more indolent variants and are absent in more aggressive disease. As mentioned earlier, cutaneous mastocytosis is one of the three main categories. It's defined by its clinical features, histologic evidence of mast cell infiltrate of the dermis, as well as an absence of systemic involvement in the bone marrow or other organs. More specifically, the diagnostic criteria from systemic mastocytosis, which we'll review shortly, must not be met. Within the category of cutaneous mastocytosis, three distinct clinical histopathologic variants are recognized by the WHO. These variants share some general features, including derriere sign, in which mechanical irritation from stroking of the skin induces swelling, reddening, and itching. And this finding is actually pathognomonic for mastocytosis. And it was named after Ferdinand Jean Derrier, a French physician also credited for the discovery of a number of other disease processes listed here. Microscopic features present in most cutaneous mastocytosis lesions include an increased number of mast cells in the dermis and intraepidermal accumulation of melanin. And these findings are evident in the first variant of cutaneous mastocytosis, urticaria pigmentosa, or maculopapular cutaneous mastocytosis. And this is the most common form of cutaneous mastocytosis, and this particular entity has two variants, polymorphic, which is more common and usually presents in children with larger, more papular lesions, and the monomorphic variant in which lesions are usually on the thighs and trunk. They tend to be smaller, reddish brown in color, uh, and this is more typical of the presentation we see in adults. As such, this variant is also more likely to persist into adulthood or even transform to systemic mastocytosis. Microscopically, the lesions show loosely scattered or grouped aggregates of spindled mast cells filling the papillary dermis and extending as sheets and aggregates into the reticular dermis, sometimes in a perivascular and periadnexal distribution. Additionally, we also see few ma fewer mast cells in adults uh, with this condition than we do in children. Here the mast cells are nicely seen with gamza staining on the left, and on the right we can see strong expression of CD117 in a membranous pattern. The next variant is diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis. And this variant occurs almost exclusively in children, and clinically, the skin of the whole body shows diffuse thickening and develops a grainy leather or orange peel like appearance with no discrete individual lesions. Biopsy usually shows a band like infiltrate of mast cells in the papillary and upper reticular dermis, but more massively infiltrated skin can show features that appear the same as mastocytoma, uh, which is the final WHO recognized variant of cutaneous mastocytosis. Mastocytoma of the skin presents as a single nodular lesion. It has a slight predilection for the trunk and scalp, and again, it occurs almost exclusively in children. Uh, usually, it develops in the first six months of life and spontaneously resolves after several years. Histologically, we see sheets of mature-looking, highly metachromatic mast cells with abundant cytoplasm, and these cells densely infiltrate the papillary and reticular dermis and may extend into the subcutaneous tissue as well. Of note, cytologic atypia is absent, which is important as this allows for the distinction of mastocytoma from the extremely rare mast cell sarcoma of the skin. Lastly, I'd like to make mention of TMEP, an entity not currently recognized in the WHO. This is actually another form of cutaneous mastocytosis. It presents with multiple persistent asymptomatic flat reddish-brown lesions on the skin in which telangiectasias may or may not be present. 
It affects the trunk and arms and, uh, or legs and covers both sides of the body in a symmetric pattern. Unlike the other cutaneous mastocytoses, TMEP occurs more frequently in young adults, and interestingly, Ferrier's sign is actually absent. Microscopically, these lesions show an increased number of mast cells around blood vessels, but the diagnosis itself relies on both the biopsy and the clinical picture. So why isn't this included uh, in the WHO? Well, one of the reasons is that this entity technically doesn't fulfill one of the major criteria for cutaneous mastocytosis, the presence of Gariaceae. However, major and minor criteria are really more clearly defined in the consideration of systemic mastocytosis. So let's take a closer look at those criteria. To meet the diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis, all major and at least one minor or three or more minor criteria must be met. The major criteria references the presence of mast cell aggregates defined as clusters of 15 or more cells in the bone marrow or other extracutaneous organs. And the minor criteria touch on the presence of a spindled or atypical morphology in more than 25% of mast cells, an activating point mutation in KIT, CD25 expression, and clinical features including a serum tryptase persistently greater than 20. Systemic mastocytosis is often first considered on the basis of clinical symptoms, which as you can imagine are quite diverse in a systemic disease process. And as bone marrow involvement is, commonly, uh, is common, hematologic abnormalities are quite important to recognize as well. Of those listed here, eosinophilia is among the most common. As with cutaneous mastocytosis, additional diagnostic criteria are specific to the variants of systemic mastocytosis. Microscopically, we mentioned the presence of mast cell aggregates as being a major criteria for systemic mastocytosis. The first minor criteria mentions that more than 25% of mast cells are spindled, atypical, or immature. In the images on the top row, we can see several mast cell morphologies that would fall under this category. Images B, C, and D show atypical features, including hypogranularity, bilobed nuclei, eccentrically located nuclei, and spindling. Other minor criteria of our, are of particular importance when we don't see aggregates, because in these cases it can be really difficult to know the cause of a mast cell institute, and so additional studies that can identify aberrant immunophenotypes can be very helpful. Immature mast cells can be identified with tryptase and CD117, but for identifying neoplastic mast cells, aberrant CD25 expression, which is one of the minor criteria, less commonly CD2, as well as CD30 in a subset of cases, can be very helpful. And these can be identified by either flow cytometry or immunohistochemistry. As with cutaneous mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis has several variants listed in the WHO. They can be categorized on the basis of bone marrow and peripheral blood involvement, as well as the presence of B and C findings. These B and C findings refer to an increased mast cell burden uh, versus impaired organ function for B and C findings respectively. So for instance, hepatomegaly without uh, functional impairment is a B finding, but in the presence of ascites or abnormal LFTs, it becomes a C finding. Here we have a nice algorithmic approach to categorize the systemic mastocytosis. So in cases where the bone marrow aspirate shows less than 20% involvement and no B or C findings, or sometimes no more than one B finding, we can consider this indolent systemic mastocytosis. It has a low mast cell burden, skin lesions are usually present, and a kit mutation is seen in more than 90% of patients. There is a subtype called bone marrow mastocytosis in which the serum tryptase levels are normal or near normal. And this is usually the singular B finding that can be seen in indolent systemic mastocytosis. If two or more B findings are present, uh, then we, uh, the consideration becomes smoldering systemic mastocytosis. This usually has a higher mast cell burden, uh, skin lesions, organomegaly without functional impairment, 
as well as multi-lineage involvement. The clinical course is often stable for many years, but it can progress. And again, the kit mutation is present in most patients, usually in several myeloid lineages and sometimes even in lymphocytes. Once C findings are present, we escalate to aggressive systemic mastocytosis. B findings are variable here, but when present, they do indicate a higher mast cell burden. Most of these patients have no skin findings and most have a kit mutation, although additional mutations can also be seen. The final category on this side of the algorithm uh, is systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm. This process fulfills the criteria for both systemic mastocytosis and additional non-mast cell lineage disease. Most often, this is CMML, but other, usually myeloid processes, can also be found. Uh, while KIT is usually identified, additional mutations present depend on the associated neoplasm, and the accumulation of these does have prognostic significance. When mast cells occupy more than 20% of the bone marrow aspirate, we can call this process a mast cell leukemia. Morphologically, these mast cells uh, are typically round rather than spindled, no skin lesions are present, and C findings are usually present due to malignant mast cell infiltration. This carries a poor prognosis with a less than one year survival in most patients. Uh, mast cell leukemia usually harbors atypical kit mutations and may require sequencing of the kit gene. Three subsets of mast cell leukemia are a leukemic uh, MCL in which the peripheral blood contains less than 10% mast cells, classic in which the peripheral blood contains greater than or equal to 10% mast cells, and chronic uh, mast cell leukemia in which the mast cells are mature and the clinical course tends to be less aggressive. Thinking back to our case, the mast cell infiltrate here was concerning for mastocytoma or systemic mastocytosis. With this in mind, we can take a closer look uh, at our patient and we see that they, she reported a number of concerning symptoms which she had been experiencing for an extended period of time. She was referred to rheumatology who also uh, noted concern for a possible mast cell process. A full workup was initiated uh, which proved to be fairly unremarkable. She had a mild eosinophilia, but was negative for CKIT mutation, and tryptase levels were within normal limits. A bone marrow biopsy was also performed to evaluate for systemic mastocytosis. It showed an increased number of mast cells, but only comprising 4% uh, cellularity, and without any significant spindling or clustering. CD117 was utilized and only highlighted rare loosely aggregated mast cells forming clusters of less than 15 cells, the most significant of which is shown here. Aberrant CD2 and CD25 expression couldn't be reliably demonstrated on deeper sections either. Flow cytometry, FISH for myeloid neoplasia, karyotype analysis, and myeloid NGS were all performed, but did not result with any clinically diagnostic findings, and the case was signed out as sub-threshold for systemic mastocytosis, although an early evolving mast cell process was not ruled out. It was therefore determined that the patient was likely presenting with a cutaneous mastocytosis complicated by mast cell activation syndrome. So how does this relate to her presenting symptom of hair loss? Alopecia itself is a highly complex multifaceted disease process but it can be broadly classified as non-scarring and scarring. In the non-scarring uh, variant, there is little to no inflammation, uh, or the inflammation is directed at the non-permanent cycling portion of the hair follicle. Some of the variants are listed here. Scarring alopecia can be subdivided into primary or secondary. In primary scarring alopecia, an inflammatory process specifically targets the hair follicle and the disease process is classified according to the predominant inflammatory cell type. With this in mind, the etiology for most types of primary scarring alopecia remains unknown. In secondary scarring alopecia, an inflammatory process is present where the hair follicle is damaged secondarily, as might be seen in fungal infections, sarcoidosis, or burns. So do mast cells have a place in this simplified scheme? 
Well, not exactly. While mast cells are commonly seen in the fibrous sheath of hair follicles, the understanding of what constitutes a normal presence is not well defined. There are two case reports suggesting increased numbers of mast cells in scarring alopecia, but many uh, cases don't have a significant number. Similarly, large numbers of mast cells have also been reported in scalp biopsies from patients without hair loss. Those that believe mast cells do play a role in this process have proposed various mechanisms, including the triggering of increased elastin fiber synthesis, release of fibroblasts and vascular endothelial-derived growth factors, paragrowth modulation secondary to mast cell-derived heparins, and other pro-inflammatory interleukins, uh, which are involved in collagen synthesis and cutaneous fibr fibroplasia. Interleukin 17A, in particular, is expressed by mast cell aggregates and may have uh, a pro-fibrotic effect on fibroblasts. However, no definitive conclusions have been established at this time. So what does this mean for our patient? Well, her scalp biopsy was not consistent with scarring alopecia in the first place, but alopecia areata. Further investigation was attempted with CD2 and CD25 to evaluate the mast cells, both of which were negative. Uh, but due to suboptimal sections, a repeat biopsy was requested. Uh, interestingly, when the patient was seen by dermatology again, her scalp lesions and hair loss had resolved entirely. She was placed on a number of medications to address her uh, other chronic symptoms and appeared to be doing quite well overall. One of the challenges with this case and others like it is that the diagnostic criteria for mastocytosis in the skin uh, can be quite unclear. The criteria established in bone marrow is not directly translatable to the skin. The diagnosis can also be very challenging in the skin when the mast cell counts are low or the condition may be compounded by an inflammatory cutaneous disorder. Moreover, in the skin, neoplastic mast cells tend to have a more normal cytologic morphology rather than that which we see in the bone marrow. They don't typically form aggregates and CD25 is not particularly reliable in the skin either. One recent study sought to address this gap by analyzing skin biopsies from 103 patients with mastocytosis and comparing them with biopsies from inflammatory skin lesions and normal skin. They examined distribution patterns, cell percentages, and cell counts, and found that the most significant diagnostic feature was a mast cell percentage of 40%. They noted that a sheet-like or subepidermal distribution pattern was also specific for mastocytosis, and that cell counts were highly variable and only helpful when reported as a percentage of total inflammatory cells present. Others are also working on addressing these issues with the application of artificial intelligence. One group utilized newly developed software to assist with cell counts and cutaneous lesions. Though they were not able to establish diagnostic cutoffs for the subtypes of cutaneous mastocytosis, the hope is that this technology could improve the utility of cell count as a diagnostic criteria in general. These are my scores. Thank you.